So here we are. So uh, using video games as a learning tool for elite racing drivers. Now, th this is a, a variation of a, of a presentation that I gave elsewhere earlier this week. Um, but really, you know, I want to devote 15 minutes to just uh, this talk. And then afterwards, we'll have kind of a 15 minute question and answer or, or discussion period, because I think that's where we'll be able to tie it back to hockey and what we can do with with our players or the coaches that we work with. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so for those of you guys who are not familiar with racing, um, so Formula One cars are essentially the, the fastest and the most sophisticated racing cars on the planet. And what's been happening is that since uh, 1950, which is when the Formula One level was created, uh, the cars are always getting faster, more, more sophisticated, better handling, but also harder to drive. Now, um, a, a Formula One car probably costs north of $10 million. So th these are very high performance tools that you don't want to mess around with. So now the question becomes, how can drivers get fully prepared to make a jump from a lower level to uh, you know, the equivalent to the NHL in racing terms? Um, So if you look on the left, this is a, uh, on the left-hand side is, is a Ferrari Formula One car from 1979. And then on the right-hand side is a Ferrari Formula One car from 2020. Um, you know, you can see kind of there, there's a similar idea, like both cars are pretty low to the ground. Uh, you have some wings to create downforce. You have some fat tires to help the car really stick to the racetrack. Uh, there's an engine in the back. So the lightest, most powerful engine that can fit in there but you also see how much more detailed and how much more sophisticated the car on the right is. You know, the car on the left was built with uh, sheet metal, whereas the one on the right is full carbon fiber. Uh, the one on the left probably cost about uh, $50,000 in, in dollars from 79, and the one on the right is north of $10 million, if not more than that. So, um, you know, you, you, you really want to make sure that the driver is well prepared to, to handle the car because if, he, if he's not and he's not ready, then, you know, really bad things can happen. Um, so now we're shifting gears here and we're looking at the progression of uh, racing games in that same time period. So if you look at 1979, like that was probably the best that the technology back, at, back then can handle. It's a top down with uh, type of game with very limited graphics looks like something that, you know, we played on Game Boys growing up. So not not realistic at all. It's it looks somewhat like a racing game, but you know, not much more than that. Uh, by the late '80s, you see this. Um, you know, there's, the, the graphics are a lot better, and you see some elements of realism. Um, you know, where it's like kind of reminiscent of what the actual track looks like, but there's Obviously, you know, it's, it's very pixelated and there's a lot of things going on in the screen that you don't see in real life. But then, you know, we step into the 90s and the 2000s. And now in 2020, we can take the screen cap from the F1 2020 game, put it next to the TV broadcast, and you can pick out all the same landmarks or all the same details on the track. So in terms of the realism, you know, the technology has come such a long way. And, and now, the, you know, the, the games um, uh, available today, even at the retail level are such great simulations of the actual sport. Now, the, the other piece of it is, is that not only is the software getting better, but you know, you, you can have a very realistic kind of simulator experience at home. So whether you start with just buying the steering wheel and the pedal and plugging it into your PS4 or into your Xbox, or you have a, a specific, a, a very kind of specialized carbon fiber tub that you sit in that's hooked up to a computer, which is hooked up to several screens. And like the, the setup on the right, that costs about $50,000. And, you know, it really, it gives you the best approximation to driving a, a real Formula One car w without you actually being on the track. So, you know, with the software getting better and the hardware getting better, now we're seeing a generation of new racing drivers who you know, instead of coming up, uh, let's say, go-karts or the lower level racing, uh, they actually grow up playing video games, get really good at those, and then eventually transition to actual racing and are able to be actually very competitive just because of how realistic the, the games are, um, how, how strong the competition is online. So, um, you know, as, as exclusive or as financially demanding hockey is, 
you know, add another zero or even two more zeros if, if you're a parent trying to put your kid through racing. Well, now you, you have such a great alternative to the, the traditional racing path, which is, you know, the, the, the virtual racing world uh, that it, it's really opened up the sport to a whole, you know, other demographic and it's really making the competition stronger and it's making the, the racing community healthier too. And, and, and for me, obviously, you know, you can't really trace a straight line between hockey and racing just because uh, racing is actually far simpler if you look at it from, you know, on a deep level. So um, basically going around the track very fast, it's an optimization problem. So first of all, you're optimizing the car uh, for, you know, straight line speed, uh, braking ability, and then handling but also as a driver, you're trying to take the shortest, most economical way around the track. So if you're racing in a simulation that, that's designed to replicate the car's characteristics and the track's characteristics, then you, you can get in hundreds or thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of reps and just find your best, uh, your best line across the track or your, your best braking points, or you know, do you enter the corner wide or do you turn in sooner? And those are all kind of things that you can figure out in a game before taking it to the track. And that is exactly the process that, you know, professional racing drivers now they use. So um, let's say that they're racing in a track that they've never been to. So they might just pull it up in a game that they own and, you know, drive a, a few dozen laps. And then, you know, their racing team might have a, a setup with a, uh, you know, a very high-end simulator at their testing facility. So then, you know, they, they can hop in and, and put in hours on that. And then eventually they make their way onto the actual track, run a few laps, get familiarized, all the while kind of picking up the same landmarks that they've, they've seen hundreds of times already. And then they can, they can really compete at full speed after that. So that, that's where the, the kind of that game transfer element that, that we're talking about really figures in. It, it's way easier in in racing than in hockey, because in racing, you're mostly competing against the track, right? Once in a while, you're going to have to pass somebody or you're going to have to prevent somebody from passing you. But the, the most important part is um, getting on the track and driving the track in a fast, smooth, efficient manner. And, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about how important anal analytics is in hockey. Well, you know, racing has been there for almost 30 years now. So if you look at this printout, it, it gives you a sense of, um, you know, the, the red line being the Ferrari F1 car and the green line being the Mercedes car. You see like the Ferrari is a little bit, the, the top speed is a little bit higher at the start of the lap, but then every corner, the Ferrari is losing, losing ground because it can't quite keep as much speed as, as the Mercedes. So what, what happens is when you really study these analytics uh, as a driver, you can see, you know, what adjustments you have to make to the car or, you know, what sectors of the track are you efficient in? What sectors you're inefficient in? Are you breaking too early, too late? Um, are you, you know, having trouble maintaining your speed throughout a corner? So those are all very actionable things that you can, uh, whether it's virtually or, you know, in real life testing, you, you can refer back to this and then, you know, change your training or, or make adjustments in your driving style to, to figure out what, you know, how to get a better lap. So the video that I'm going to show you now, let me know if you don't see it, but it's, it's a YouTube video with Lewis Hamilton from 2014. So what, what he does is he actually takes us uh, through a lap of the Monaco Grand Prix in the Mercedes simulator. And, and you see how he's able to talk through his entire lap and talk about his thought process and what he's looking out for. So really. Are you guys able to see this video? I can see it, but I can't hear anything. You can't hear it? No. I can hear you, but I can't hear it. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, as long as you can, uh, as long as you can see it. So, so essentially, what you're seeing on the screen is is Lewis Hamilton's driving virtually, but he's actually giving you very detailed inputs about every corner on the track. Like he knows it. Uh, like the back of his hand. So he's telling you, you know, here you should be looking out for, you know, th th there's some bumps, so you gotta be careful. Here you wanna break late and turn in 
Uh, here you're almost brushing um, the, the barriers as you come out. Like there, you, you see how many little things you have to be mindful of. It, it, it's like playing hockey, right? Like you're, you're looking for a stick position or, or if you're looking for a goalie's body language, it, it's the same thing on a track. Like every track has a signature. Every track has little quirks that you're trying to remember and then be mindful of, right? So for example, in this tunnel here, you're going about uh, 200 miles an hour, but there's very little grip there. Then you're coming onto the sunlight and then you got to break very hard for this chicane right here. So, the, you know, the input has to be very, very precise. And, you know, in, in real life, you can't make a mistake there, but on a simulator, you can push and push and push. And eventually, you know, you might go, go too hard and, and crash, but it's not a big deal because you can get those reps and, you know, there's no actual physical damage from you making a mistake there. So yeah, so so the idea is is that for racing drivers, if if you're not using simulators, if you're not you know playing video games as a training tool, then it's almost like a hockey player who refuses to lift weights. Like you're missing out on a very significant part of your training. Now, um, for for us hockey people, like we think of video games as a distraction for our players or something that you know can only hurt them. But really, if you look at um, you know, the, the benefits of whether it's for racing drivers or whether it's for pilots, um, th there is a way to use games to develop weeds or to develop hockey IQ or to develop um, all these soft, soft skills that then allows players to perform better on the ice. So that's it for me. Uh, any questions from you guys? So here, here's a question in terms of, um, you know, it's a similar, you know, I think idea in a sport like football where you're just like repping the same things over and over and over again so that, you know, it becomes second nature. And, you know, there's definitely elements of that in hockey training as well. But taking something like this, you know, how would you apply it to a hockey player who's trying to add to his skill set? So, so I think – the, the way that um, hockey coaching is done for the most part is we, we tell a player to do something and then they do it. And then if, if we're good coaches, then we give them feedback based on, based on what they've done. Right. Right. Uh, so for instance, if I'm teaching a player how to attack better off the rush, well, I can tell them, you know, if, if you use the middle more, whether it's by carrying the puck into the middle or finding a teammate that's in the middle, like that's going to improve your overall effectiveness off the rush. And, and, and then, you know, I might design some drills for the player to rep it out and for him to, to feel what, you know, what that's like and, and how that works out for him. But basically, you know, before he makes, he does a physical rep, he has to kind of take my word for it that middle entries is going to be good for him, right? Whereas right. If, if I give him a copy of NHL 20 and an Xbox or a PS4 and I, and I tell him, okay, well, go into practice mode, uh, set it as two versus three rush and then just like rep out 20 or 30 entries and then see what works better for you. Is it attacking the middle or, or using wide speed or, you know, and, and that's actually going to get the player thinking um, and, and giving himself feedback. Right. So of course the game is not going to be a perfectly realistic simulation of what happens in real life, but at least, you know, the, the fact that he's trying out these things, for himself and playing around with different, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, different stick handling moves, uh, puck protection, or, um, you know, passing versus holding the puck. Like the fact that he feels that he has the initiative and that he's um, able to experiment. Um, I think that that's really going to help with the buying later on. No, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, so James, did, like, did you play the NHL series growing up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, so it's like, you know, you, you can, like, now there's a practice mode, but when I started playing, like, my, my first game was uh, NHL 2002. Like, you know, the, the game wasn't nearly as good back then, but you can essentially rep out um, your entire season worth of puck touches in an afternoon, right? Like if you're, if you're a junior player, you might touch the puck. Let's say if you play 15 minutes a game and you touch the puck once every 30 seconds, that that's 30 touches like on the high end.
or junior player. Right. Whereas you can get 30 touches in, in under five minutes in, in a game. So it's just the ability to, to use trial and error. And it's almost like the, the other example I can think of is um, the really elite poker or the really elite chess players. They're playing not just one game at a time, but they're playing 10, 15, 20 games at the same time. And first of all, they're able to be competitive and, and win. Uh, but second of all, just, you know, maximizing their time and getting 10 times or 20 times as, as much as many reps in in the same uh, given amount of time like that does wonders for their ability to recognize patterns or to apply you know what we call sense or iq mm -hmm. uh, anybody else with uh, questions or uh, thoughts yeah i got one for um the video games, do you see it more helpful for the individual there or on a coaching system side of thing um, as a good place to maybe diagram something you're thinking about and, and seeing how it might work against the computer before taking it to uh, the ice in a game? Yeah, so, so that's a good question because if you look at racing or if you look at like uh, uh, flight simulators, uh, like they're very, very good replications of reality so i would say like what happens in, in a in a good racing or what a good flight simulation like that's like 99 percent what's going to happen in real life uh whereas let's say in nhl 20 like it's not quite there because the game you know like the the, the puck touches are cleaner and the game handles certain things better than or differently than than what you would see in real life so what, what i would see more from a hockey standpoint is it's just uh, whether you're a coach or you're a player, it's it's kind of like a sandbox, right? Like when you're a kid, when you're playing a sandbox, like it's just everything goes. Like you you don't really there there's not really any rules or there's not really any any there there's no right way to play in a sandbox, right? There might be some wrong ways, but there really is no right way. So you're just trying to figure things out and explore. And um, one thing that's really I think really neat with uh, the NHL series now is how well you can protect the puck. And you know if we're talking about like um, you know, shielding the puck and putting it in your hip pocket and keeping it away from your opponent's stick. Uh, playing the game and, and playing around with those controls actually, I, I think, uh, gives a player a really good sense of what they can do. So instead of, you know, kind of panicking, throwing the puck away, now you know that, you know what, if, if I hold the puck um, away from my opponent, and I put my body between his stick and mine, he can't take the puck away from me. So, so that increases your your poise level and your ability to hold the puck, spin off a check, and then making a play, which, which obviously is really important today. You have any questions, Kurt? Yeah, hey, Jack. Thanks for hey. organizing this. This is great. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Have you – I know USA Hockey, I think, uses, like, IntelliGym for their uh, – the, the NTDP. Have you – have you looked at any of that or have teams you've worked with used it and, and like, what's it like? Is it, is it similar to like an NHL game or is it totally different and how effective do you think it is? Yeah. So uh, the intelligence system, if I recall correctly, was originally um, developed for the Israeli air force in their fighter pilot training. Okay. So anything like the, whether it's intelligent, which I think Greg also has experience with, uh, we talked about that this morning. Um, or some of the other um, kind of training softwares, like VR-based training softwares, which um, our players use with the Leafs and Marlies when, when I was there. Um, I would say like they're, they're very good for developing spatial awareness. And, and that's, I think, the, 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 what these softwares try to hit. But what, what I think is um, even more interesting with just the, the NHL gaming series is that you're you're developing your reads or your special uh, your spatial awareness in context so it's not just in a vacuum where like you have shapes that you're trying to you know memorize or shapes that you you're trying to predict where a ball is going to go like you actually have recognizable you know it's five on five it's five on four or it's you know six on five and you have the the landmarks in the rink you have the puck you have the, the actual systems and tactics and you know just like we know, like any, any type of physical training that we do with our athletes, the more in context it is, the better the transfer is going to be. So for, for me, like, I, I kind of wonder, like, do we, you know, the, the fact that something is a, is a specialized training software, I think it, it, it might 
catch our attention or we might think that's really sexy, but just, you know, just playing a hockey video game, like, you know, you, it's hard to be more in context than that without being on the ice, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that. And it's also way cheaper, by the way. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, 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 I mean, it's um, like racing drivers have been kind of going through this process for uh, about 20 or even 25 years now, but, you know, th there really hasn't been any teams that are kind of systematically getting their players to turn their NHL gaming time into an actual training activity. So, so I think the only thing that's really missing is the, the level of understanding from, from a coach's standpoint and maybe some guidance in, you know, what to work on or what to focus on, or, you know, even it's, it's a tool to develop uh, mental toughness and resilience. Like I play online a lot and you know what, like some kids, like you go up three goals, they'll, they'll quit. They'll just stop playing. Right. So there, there's something to be said about just competing and then finding a way and gutting it out. And, and that's something that you develop um, playing online against other people. And, and also there's obviously that character aspect where, you know what, some kids are a little bit toxic, but uh, the, their teaching moments too, right? Like you, hopefully you want your players to be good people. And, you know, if you're, if you're a good person online, when it's anonymous, then you'll be a good person in real life when it's face to face. Yeah, that makes sense. So what did you, is this something that you came across as an idea through the last, you know, since you left the Leafs or was it something that you maybe threw at them as an idea? So like, like it's something that's always been part of my life just because like I, I've been gaming longer than I've been playing hockey. Like when I was four or five years old, I, I was playing computer games, stuff like that. And actually it was the, the NHL gaming series that got me back into playing hockey because I stopped for a couple of years when I was uh, eight or nine years old. And then one year um, I got it. I got the NHL 2002 game as my birthday present. And, and that really got me back into the game and talking with some people from kind of non-traditional hockey backgrounds, whether, you know, they're racial minorities or they're immigrants, a lot of their connection co with hockey comes from the game. So it's not just playing or we're watching on TV. It's, it's actually just playing on, on, a, on, on your PlayStation or an Xbox. And, and I think it's a really great opportunity to bring new people into the game and have them experience what hockey is without necessarily, you know, investing in the equipment or investing in the playing fees at first. But, you know, if, if we want the game to grow, I think this is, so for players who are already in the game, I think it's a great teaching tool, but for people who are not yet in the game, I think it's a way for them to, you know, feel welcome to, to become hockey fans. Yeah, sure. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we, we got about five minutes left. So, so any other um, questions or thoughts or, you know, discussion topics you guys want to touch on? Well, so if you're working with a player and, you know, they play, right, NHL 20, you're talking to them about starting to use it to build out their skill set. You know, you talk about if you were to, if you were to actually try to put some structure around that versus just, you know, hey, <laughs> play more NHL 20, how, like, how would you, would it be specific to the player? Like, how would you try to build something like that out, do you think? Sure. So, so I think it, like, first of all, I think the, the way that they consume, let's say, NHL 20, it's, I, I think it gives you an, some insight into them as, as, as a player and as a person, first of all. So, you know, let's say if you play career mode, right? You, you know, you, 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 you have to pick a type of player that you want to be. So whether it's a sniper, it's a playmaker, it's a dangler, it's a, it's a grinder, right. it's an enforcer. Like, so if you have this guy who's, you know, six foot four, 230 pounds, and when he plays in career mode, he's a dangler, then, then I think that says something about, you know, what maybe I'm misevaluating what kind of player this person really wants to be. And, and we know that there's definitely a, a market for, you know, big guys, but also who can, who have hands and can make plays. Right. So, so it's like the way that they use the game is going to tell you something about them as a person or as a player. And I think the first step is to understand that better. See, see if there's a, there's a mismatch there. 
No, absolutely. No, I, I never like that's that's an angle that I never even thought of. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And actually, like I speak from personal experience because, um, like, growing up, I wasn't a very high skilled kid. Like, I, I always played lower level house league, and but when I played video games, I just loved scoring goals. Like, I wanted to be a sniper. I wanted to, you know, beat goalies clean and, and find ways to to score goals. So, and and I was like, and this this is like when I was ten or eleven years old, and I was like you know, I really want to learn how to score goals. And that got me into, the, you know, whether it's watching videos on online or, or looking at instructional books or, you know, seeking out hockey camps or shooting at goalie camps. Like those are all the things that it's like what I did virtually drove tangible progress in my training because like, um, you know, it gave me some ideas or, or, or some, some outlets uh, to, for things to work on. No, for sure. Like I said, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. And then, so I guess if, so like with that player, you know, you see that there is, there's maybe a bit of a disconnect between what you thought or maybe, you know, how he's being utilized and versus how he sees himself and how he wants to grow. And then I guess you could help guide him in terms of his training and the things he's doing and try to point him in that direction. Then is that the type of thing you'd be thinking? Yeah. So it's like, if, if he's making plays, where he's doing certain things in the game, but he can't do it in real life. Now the logical question becomes, why can't he do it? Is it his skating posture? Is it because he doesn't have enough, he hasn't taken enough reps? Is it because, you know, the timing of it is off? Like at least it, it gives you, you start asking questions. And then once you have those questions, then you can address it, whether with, you know, online um, on ice training or off ice physical training or uh, off ice stick handling or, or what have you. Right. But if this player doesn't even think about trying things, in a game, then you can be sure that he's not going to be trying things on the ice. Right, right, right. No, that, that's super interesting. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So, so it's, I, for me, the first step is just recognizing that it's a great sandbox to play around in. And second, just realizing that it, it's almost like a window into somebody's soul. You know, the, what they want out of their hockey, they're going to express it virtually before they express it physically. Right. No, absolutely. So any, uh, any final thoughts or any final questions? We good? All good here. All good. Yeah, it sounds like we're good. <laughs> All right, well, enjoy your evenings. Thank you for uh, doing this. Uh, I know that Greg has already sent me his uh, proposal for a presentation. Like, I, I would love for you guys to to present on something non-hockey related uh, for all of us. So if you have an idea, uh, email me. And then uh, if you need any help with that, I can help you put, put a presentation together. Awesome. Yeah, will do. All right. Take care, guys. Good talking to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Right. Good care.